we were first talking, I said, well, I'm not, I'm not a, an inventor. Then I was talking to my, my son who works with me on the, on the air. His name is Gib. And he was like, let me, let me just list some of the things that you invented. <laughs> and so it's, um, you know, I, I, I think what's important to remember is that you mentioned it. I grew up in a place called Garden City, which is right around from where you, you grew up. And I was born in 1952. And during that period of time, there, you know, of course, there wasn't any internet. There wasn't, there was, there was no cell phones. There was one phone in the house, you know, that kind of thing. So when, and I was, a, I was a very skinny, scrawny, just not attractive kid with braces and 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 uh, and acne, clear still all over me. And my parents were, my dad was, uh, you know, he was, he was from World War II. He was an amphibious assault commander in, in the in the navy and so you know i was the third kid i was 11 years younger than my two sisters and so when i came along it was like oh gosh here we go again so you know they put me in this in this finished basement i spent most of my time there where my dad and mom were like throwing parties and stuff like that and you know back in the day your parents didn't know everything about you the, the rule was that that you you, you, you go about your business and then you come home when the street lights are, are on, you know? So I was left. And since I didn't have, I was not one of the popular kids in Garden City High School, which was a, which is a powerful high school to this day. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute because it has bearing on this. I spent a lot of time in the basement tinkering. And so I, you know, I bought a Heath kit radio uh, project and made my own radio broadcast station. I had a reel to reel tape recorder that my dad had bought and there was a piano down there. So I was always making things and creating things and just trying somehow to get noticed right and then you know garden city even if you look at it now it's really a performing arts school i didn't realize that when i was in it but but the opportunities for being in a band being in a garage band being i was the you know i was the uh the editor of the uh, of the college uh the photo editor of the, of the of the high school uh yearbook and so there were a lot of opportunities to you know to to be creative in in that time but i do think that that i had the uh, the gift of imperfection, where where I just was not wasn't great in school. I was okay. Uh, I was sort of scared of my own shadow. You know, and I know there are people who are watching right now who who understand that because back in the day, being a geek, being a dork, being the kid like me that brought the projector to uh, to the you know to the science uh, class. It wasn't cool. It wasn't cool to be in the marching band. I was in that too. You know, nowadays, it, you know, all those things are are cool. But it also enabled you to sort of develop, trying to develop a way, a way out, invent yourself, you know, so, so to speak. And so when I when I went to when I went to college, my parents stuck me at North Carolina State to study textile chemistry because my dad worked for for Haynes, and I just it was I, I was just miserable. And so I took a radio and television course. And, and I got bit by that bug where you could work for one day and you could turn something in. And, and so I wanted to change my major. And, and I went to all of my professors to, to sign the drop ad card because I was past the drop ad date. And, the, and this is actually, I wrote a book called Relentless and this story is, is, is in there in, in, in more detail because it's, it's important to what happened to me. And, and one of my teachers wouldn't sign the drop ad card and so on advice from a fraternity brother, I forged his signature on the drop ad card. And as luck would have it, uh, he found out, he reported me to the university. I was thrown out on, a, on an honor code violation. I, I was suspended indefinitely. And then my parents, which didn't surprise me, my dad threw me out of the house. And so at 19 and a half years old, I was homeless living in a park in Raleigh, North Carolina. And when you get to that point, and, and you can get to that point in many different ways, you can be you can be stuck uh, mentally, you can be stuck spiritually, you can be stuck so physically. I, was stuck. I realized after about three months in the tent that my dream at that moment was was to, to get into the media and that I had to find a way to get into a radio station. And every station I went to said you need a you need a demo tape. And I didn't I didn't have a demo tape because I didn't have a job. It was really a catch twenty two. And so I, I found a way to get into break into the to, to the campus radio lab because I was already a criminal, and uh, and I made a fake demo tape where I did all I did the traffic report. Hey, this is John Tesh, WKIX twenty twenty news. And I held my nose and did the imitations of all the correspondence and all of that. And I took that tape and, and it was it was it was one of those things of I went overboard. I did a thirty minute demo tape doing all the voices. All I, I, I did the theme on the piano. I, did, I used a, a typewriter to make it sound like a, a, a teletype, 
and, and did it all live into a reel to reel tape. And then I took that tape to radio stations, to 10 radio stations. And I got a call about a month later from a guy named Scott White, who I still stay in touch with. And he said, is this John Tesh? And I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, there was laughter in the background. And he said, did you make all these noises and do all this stuff on this tape? And I said, I said, yeah. And he goes, well, if you want a job that badly, I'll give you a job playing the religious tapes on Sunday mornings from 4 a.m. to 7, 7 a.m. And I got my foot in the door. And, you know, long story short, 36 months after that, I was a CBS News correspondent in the same building as Walter Cronkite at 23 years old in, 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 in New York City. And the reason I tell you that, that story, and I tell this story on stage when I'm in concert, too, is that there is a way in. You know, you have to figure out what the way in is, and then you have to do the work because there are plenty of people will go and they'll go say, I need a job. And this is these are my. But when you show up with something and people are able to see your grit and your persistence and, and those of you who are watching, I'm going to mention a couple of books that can really change your life. And you should, so you should be writing them down because they're really quite amazing. One of them is called Focus by Al Reese. The other is Differentiate or Die. Differentiator Die by, by Jack Trout is, is a way to figure out which lane you should be in, whether you're an inventor or you're a songwriter or you're, or, or you're an author. And nowadays, right, Brian, with, and nowadays you can use Keyword Explorer or TubeBuddy or VidIQ on YouTube and you can see what's, what's going on and you can see what's being overserved, super served. Uh, and, and, and you can, whatever you, whatever you are interested in, you can see if there's an, if there's a tangent, if there's an intersection between what you're interested in and what's popular right now. So it's, it's, these, these are amazing tools that didn't exist back in the day. It's, it's very interesting. And, and that's the thing you have certain points in your life that you need to make decisions for. So you had that aha moment where you had to make a change. And many of us, John, we come up with an idea. It's not like we woke up and said, we're going to be an inventor and this is our full time job. This is something that we have our careers. We have things that are going on in our life and we come up with this invention. And now it's something that maybe it can change our life. Is it something that could be residual income for us? Is it something that can actually be our full blown income? And then we have to make some decisions on what we're going to do and going through those steps. So just like you, you had to get yourself up to move your idea of what you wanted to do forward. That's what we have to do. Again, whether it's any t anything in life or business or your invention, just picking that lane. And I know that uh, one of the audience members that are on, Sean Taylor, she always says, I'm in my lane. I'm, I'm going in, in my lane, right, John? I see you on here. So well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell yeah. you that there's a. I, I have a, a friend. My wife and I uh, met, and my daughter met uh, a kid named Lin Manuel Miranda. After we saw a, a Broadway show that he won a Tony for, called In the Heights, and then I got invited to go to the Public Theater in New York a few years back to see 250 people watch Hamilton, and and you know I went backstage and 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 talk to him and he, I mean, he, it was like, I, he gets like, what did you think? Do you think we have something? And I'm like, what? you have Sergeant Peppers is what you have, you know, right here. But he did an interview on 60 Minutes, which is exactly what you were just talking about, where he was asked, uh, you know, there's so many, when you went, when you went to, when you went to school at Hunter College, you know, there were so many kids and there's so many people in the, in the theater business that have so much more experience than you and have, have so much more success. Why you? Why did you end up creating this thing that's bigger than any show that's ever been on, on, on Broadway? And he said, you know, I picked a lane. I picked a lane and I didn't come out of it. And he said, there were times when I wanted to go out with my friends. There were times when my, I wanted to be with my wife at a dinner party. And there were times when I actually, when I wanted to get more than three hours of sleep. But, but I, I knew that I had something and I stayed in the lane and I made that commitment. So Angela Duckworth wrote a book called Grit, which I highly recommend. And, oh, that's a good one. and you know, there's another part of my life where in 2015, I was given 18 months to live with a horrible cancer diagnosis. And so the, the, same, the same lane that I chose to get out of that pup tent and get, get onto to, to CBS News and, and to, to, to do a public television special when nobody would sign me up on their on their record label 
and a public television special that we raised twenty million dollars for public television and started my 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 music career. But it was that it was that same grit and persistence that I had to use with my wife as my advocate to get on the on the other side of of cancer. And so the the picking the lane thing is a great metaphor because if you could if you could stay in that lane and then you can also see the finish line and you have to be able to visualize that finish line. I mean you can really accomplish anything. <music>